Hallelujah. When one of our classmates does his head, I was born again, he was crying. He said, Kizo is born again. Because he had been born again in school. And when he heard, it, it touched him so much that he was crying. But thank God. See what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. See what the Lord has done. Praise God. Um, so um, I want to appreciate everybody. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for bringing me. Um, it was a tight schedule, but uh, your pastor is one of the few people, him and this guy, Pastor Toyo, see, we're the people that can corner me and make me come out after um, I had had an incredibly busy um, few weeks. Uh, we, we did our Canada tour. Um, we were on 20 flights in about three weeks. We were on 20 flights. At some point, we were like robots. We didn't know where we were or what we were doing, you know, different time zones. So after that, he's the only kind of person that can make me still fly out all the way here. And, I'm, and let's help him appreciate Pastor Emmanuel and his beautiful wife. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Please have your seats. Please have your seats. Um, happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the house. Finally, they give us a day. <laughs> our struggle, our fight has finally paid off. Women have like three Mother's Day. We have just one Father's Day. Hallelujah. But we thank God for progress. Amen, amen. Um, as usual, like Pastor mentioned, um, we travel with books. Please, I encourage you, get the books. Now, if today it is Father's Day, so please, all women, even if you're not married, if you're planning to marry, but especially those that are married, please get this book all year round for women. So, what we did is that there's an all year round for men too, but I'm not going to bother men today. It's women, it's Father's Day. Buy this book. Um, I shared 50, my wife shared 52 tips for 52 weeks. It's an all year round, things you can do for your husband every week. And during the convention, one woman opened one page and saw something and said, Jesus. <laughs> uh, even me, when they told me what was in the page, I didn't know that was in the book. <laughs> she said, Jesus, it's is, 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 is explicit. <laughs> she said, Jesus, but she said, give me two. Give me one for myself and one for my cousin. <laughs> she still bought two. <laughs> so if you're married woman, please, um, as a Father's Day gift, buy this for your husband. It's for you, but it will show you things you can do for him. That will make him happy. Man, am I helping? Yeah. Clap for me now. You didn't encourage me. <laughs> Praise God. So please, all women get that. Um, we have these books. Uh, Pastor Manuel, um, I found out that some marriages will make it without prayer. Some marriages will make it without prayer. So um, we have these books titled Praying for Your Husband, Praying for Your Wife. And I kid you not, um, I am who I am today with all the other things going for me. But one of the major things that helps and has been helping me is my wife's prayer. All right? She prays for me. She prays for me. And it is working. I've seen the difference. All right? So if you're a woman, again, this Father's Day, by praying for your husband, it's specific prayer points, specific scriptures that you can pray for a man or your husband. Whether it's your present husband or husband to be, or you have never seen him at all, you're just praying for him so that anywhere he is, let his head be correct. So that when he comes, you won't waste your time. Um, it's a good book to get praying for your husband. Now, if you're a wife, don't just buy praying for your husband because you need your husband to also pray for you. So buy praying for your wife. Then give him later, not today. But buy it now. Then give him later. So that he too can pray for you because uh, men don't know that women actually find it very romantic when a man can pray. Praise God. So pray for your husband, pray for your wife. And we normally say, if you marry well, you marry a prayer partner. If you marry wrong, you marry a prayer point. Ladies, this is seven questions wise women ask. Um, I said it during the camp, that women ask the best questions when they are not in love. All right? When they're not in love, they're curious. They are, they are clear. Their mind is working well. They're asking questions. What does he do? Where is he going? How educated is he? What does he earn? But when women are in love, they usually don't know the right questions to ask. So, seven questions wise women ask to clarify issues for you. I said it in the camp that one of the questions a woman must ask if a man wants to marry you is when. Ask when. Don't let anybody date you indefinitely. All right? Don't let anybody date you indefinitely. All right? I had a friend many years ago. He dated one girl for 10 years. 10 years. And they didn't still marry. When the lady got tired and left, he dated another one for another 10 years. Two terms. <laughs> Two terms. 
Even presidency is for four years, but he did 10 years twice. And still didn't marry the second one. Yes. So may you not enter those kind of indefinite dating. All right? So please, there are seven questions you must ask as a lady if a man wants to marry you. Especially for those that are single here. If a man wants to marry you, there are seven deliberate questions you need to ask. One of them is when. When men enter relationships, they don't work with biological clock. They work with financial clock. So a man is never in a hurry when it comes to marriage. For him, it's, not, it's his career that is his concern. You as a woman, your, 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 everything about your life is time-based. As a woman, from an early age, you enter your cycle. You understand time. So you can't just enter indefinite relationships. Men can have children at any age. I, have an uncle. I used to have an uncle that was this height. My uncle. Because my great grandfather was so married and had children at, when he was 70-something. So I had an uncle that was like this. I used to carry him with respect. It's my uncle. If we're sharing meat, he has to pick before me. Because he's my uncle. <laughs> Men can have children at any age. That's what I mean. Men can have children at any age. Women usually cannot. So, all right? So, please, um, seven questions you must ask. For men, hey, guys, single guys, I want to beg you. There are seven qualities wise men want. Most men don't think they need to know about marriage. That's just how we are instinctively. We are more interested in making money. We're more interested in career. And a lot of men are in crisis marriages. Men are not, not just as vocal as women. There are more men in crisis marriage than you can imagine. They are suffering and going through hell. But they just can't share it. They use work and sports and other things to deflect it. But they are in crisis because they married just from their eyes. How beautiful the lady was. They just married. They don't know that there are qualities for you as a man that you need to look out for in a woman before you marry. Forget how she looks. You are not marrying just her body. There are seven qualities wise men want. Most men have cancelled in crisis marriages after, I ask, after they tell me their problem and everything going on, I say, so how did you even marry this woman in the first place? And without fail, Pastor Manuel, without fail, I kid you not, 99% of the time, what the man will say is, I was just in church and she was just passing. Something told me. She's my wife. That's it. That's how men decide. That I was just in church. She was singing in the choir. I just told myself, she's my wife. Finish. No criteria. Men don't realize that you have needs also. And hopefully as we go on today, because it's Father's Day, I will share some of it. You have needs as a man. And when you don't realize this, this is why when a man you marry, if your life doesn't go forward significantly when you marry, go and check how you made that decision most times. The design of marriage itself is supposed to propel you forward. The Bible says a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband's head. What does a crown do to an ordinary man? It makes him a king. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? The same Bible said, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains what? Favor. A woman, if you expect when you marry the right kind of woman, is supposed to drastically, obviously, clearly improve your life. And it's because, the reason why that's not happening for a lot of people is that they are marrying a slay queen. So she's slaying, slaying you. <laughs> All right? So there are qualities to look out for. One of them, I'll mention one. One of the qualities you need to look out for as a man is peace of mind, for instance. When I mean peace of mind, I know everybody wants peace. No, that's not what I mean. For men, you don't just want peace, you need peace. Because the way your mind and brain is wired, your brain cannot function in chaos. A woman's own can function in chaos. Women function well in chaos. Because they have two sides of their brain working at the same time. A woman clearly can... That's why if you're making love to your wife or something, she can be asking you, is the door locked? One brain is with you on the bed. The other one is going around the house. Checking if the window is locked. If food is put back in the fridge. She, has, she, she, she can do more than one thing at the same time. She thrives in chaos. But you as a man, because your main function is vision, you are created to have a one-track mind. You need to understand this. All right? When I have the time, maybe when we do it, I'll show you how the purpose of marriage was designed for us to complement each other. So that's why we are not similar at all. If we are similar, we are useless to ourselves. We are different. A woman is into details. A man is into focus. That's what it takes to make a good team. If two of us are into details, we will have an issue with our focus. The issue with, again, one of the issues, women are into details. That's why they also have the challenge of pettiness. Because when you are into details, you are picking both important details and unimportant details. Because that's how your mind is wired. You can pick things. Women are seeing colors. Men don't see colors. Men don't see all these details. Oh, the average man needs only two pairs of shoes, white and, and black and brown. He's not seeing colors. A woman, if a woman says blue, 
That blue is not just blue. She knows there's turquoise blue, sky blue, baby blue, powder blue. She knows that blue is different. But for man, blue is blue. A woman is into details. A woman understands that it was when I got married, I knew that women are not like, women have soap for hair. Different from soap for face. Different from soap for body. Different from soap for leg. The same thing with cream. They have cream for face, hair. Different from cream for face, cream for neck, cream for leg. All men need is one bar soap. They use that soap to bath, use it to wash their clothes, use the soap to wash their car. One soap. We don't need all those things. All our shampoos are called hair and shoulders. They know they can't separate it. The same thing you use to wash your hair, wash it bath. We don't have time for nonsense. <laughs> so women have incredible gift of details. There's a reason. Because men don't have that. They men, men are called for focus. That's why if a, if, if a man, if this, room, if this is a man's bed and it's scattered, if a man can find one line, where he can lie down, he will have a good night's sleep. If a woman is in a room that is scattered, her brain will keep turning. She needs to arrange that room before she can sleep. So, we both can be alike. She is gifted with details, but she has to censor that because she's receiving both important details and unimportant details. But the man is created for... So, now, talking to the men, because you are, your mind is created for focus, you need peace of mind to actually focus. You, men think deeper but slower. Women think faster, but they generally are not created to think further. That's not their calling. Not that they, are, they lack the ability, but generally men are called for vision and focus. Men think slower. Men think very slow compared to women. That's why women don't understand. When you're talking to your husband and he says, I want to go and think. She's saying, so as you are here, you are not thinking. Because a man needs an appointment to think. He needs an appointment to go and think because his mind works slowly. He needs calmness and peace. Then the slow process of thinking will start. But women think on their feet. As women are talking, they are thinking. They don't understand what you mean you want to go and think. Let's just talk now and think. He said, no, if I'm talking, I'm not thinking. If I'm thinking, I'm not talking. A man will go and think. He'll go and sit down and think for hours. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So I say, man, your brain needs quietness and calmness. So if you marry a contentious woman, that's why Professor Emeritus Solomon David said, that if you marry, those in the first service knew who, know who Professor Emeritus Solomon David is. If you marry a contentious woman, say you go and live in the corner of the roof because your mind can't function. Say if you marry a contentious woman, you go and live in the wilderness or on, on the roof because you, you need that serenity to your, your mind. A man's mind, if a man is standing here and he wants to think his life to that point, if he's thinking and thinking and thinking and gets here, if you interrupt him, he has to come and restart. <laughs> so peace of mind is so valuable to you as a man. That space, that quietness. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So there are about seven qualities. Most men don't know their own needs. They just want to marry. But when you get into the marriage, you realize that these qualities are very important. There's one here titled Manual, the way men think. Women, all women should get this one. Women are always disturbing me. Pastor, why do women, why do men think like this? Why do men think like this? They're always surprised that men are very different. When a man is chasing you, you are the project. Mwen asked me all the time, Pastor, when he was chasing me, you had time for me. You were calling me on after the night. Now I have agreed. Now we are dating. He's busy. Because men are project driven. Men are project driven. Atten like I told you, you are created for focus. At some point, you were the focus. You were the project. So he was calling you every day, chasing you every day. The moment you say yes, project completed. He moves to the next project. It's not his fault. He, even he doesn't understand why he's so demotivated. The moment he achieves something, he needs to pursue another thing. You are not the project anymore. And most women spend the rest of their life competing with his next project instead of complementing his next project. If you want to stay relevant in his life, complement his next project. Don't try to be his project. He's not wired for you to be his project. The first thing God gave Adam was work before he gave him a wife. Adam, for many years, focused on his work. If Adam didn't pray for a wife, he didn't know he needed a wife. He was just going about talking to animals and eating grass. Chewing grass and having a nice time. It was God that looked at him and said, <laughs> Oh, my <shame. laughs> it's, not, it's not good for this man to be alone. Adam didn't pray for a wife. So you need to understand, a man is wired to focus on his assignment. He's not wired to... So the only way to make him still keep seeing you is to be a part of his next assignment. He'll constantly see you. He'll see you as an asset, not as a distraction. Many women now start becoming a distraction. Is it every time you go to work? Is it every time you go to church? Is it every time? Don't, don't, don't pose as a distraction. The moment he sees you as a distraction, he will start avoiding you. Is somebody get what I'm saying? 
So I answered more questions like that to women that are always confused. So manual. You know when you buy a phone, they give you manual. Am I correct? So this is manual for men. If you understand how men think. Praise God. I bought two pit bulls when I just got married. They told me these dogs are too dangerous for you to have them without being able to control them. So they, I got a trainer to train me how to train the dogs. <laughs> because they're too dangerous. You, you don't use leash to control pit bulls. You must be able to command them. And the, the trainer told me, these are pack animals. So you don't command them because you are the auger. You must dominate them. You must show that you are the stronger personality. That's, that's how animals respect each other. They don't respect by age. If you're not stronger than me, I'll beat you. <laughs> you must show that you are the dominant. So they say, if you tell the dog, sit down, don't repeat the command. If you say, sit. If he doesn't obey that, don't have any interaction with you until he obeys that first command. But that, before when he says, sit, say, sit, sit. You repeat, I beg, please, sit down. He said, no. So, but that's long. so the point is that man will help you. This one is titled, Come on, Love Lies, that will stop you from finding true love. A lot of young people today are looking for true love, but they are following lies about love. All right? Very important. Come on, Love Lies. One of the good books. This one is How to Make Love to a Woman Without Touching Her. Hmm. All men, you need this one. <laughs> men don't realize that women and men have the same composition, but in different order. A woman is first emotional, secondly, she's spiritual, thirdly, she's mental, lastly, she's physical. Physical is a last. Most men don't realize that. Unfortunately for men, men have the same composition in different order. Men are first physical, secondly, mental, thirdly, um, emotional, I mean, then last, thirdly, spiritual, then lastly, emotional. So it's upside down. Women are first emotional. They see, see life from first an emotional point of view. And again, by the way, that's not a bad thing because the secular world makes everything different about men and women bad. When women are family-oriented, they make you look like bad. No, come and compete with men. You can never compete with men in work. We're wired for work. This is why a lot of men are still fulfilled if they're not married. In fact, most billionaires, the richer people get, the more likely they will get divorced. The higher the chances. Most billionaires in my own country where I come from are either divorced or have many wives. As of five years ago, nine out of the ten richest men in the world were divorced. Because men get for me from work. A man doesn't mind being very successful and not getting married. Doesn't mind at all. So don't let anybody make you feel bad for being a woman or for being emotional. Two of us can be logical. We men who are looking for emotions, you now want to lose your emotion. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Because that's what the world does. If you say a woman is emotional, it gets some people angry. No, it should not. We were trying to be emotional. There are times the man wants to cry. He doesn't know how to cry because this situation requires crying, but he can't cry. He's just so stiff. They opened the brain of a man and a woman. They found that the woman's brain is full of emotions everywhere. A man's own is just two spots that have emotions. And one of the spots is for sports. That's why you see men crying in football. When they lose World Cup or win World Cup, they cry. The same men that have never kissed their wife, they kiss trophy. <laughs> so they're only emotional when it comes to sports. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So, so a woman is first emotional. This means everything she does is linked to how she feels. Everything she does, does is linked to her emotions. Followed by that, she's spiritual. Most women are very spiritual. The average woman is, is plugged into many online platforms. Either prayer, fellowship, different things online. Because she has a spiritual need to be filled. A lot of men never rise up to fill that need. So they're always complaining, why does my wife respect the pastor? He doesn't respect me. Very simple. The pastor is feeling an emotional need that you are not willing to feel. So if you want to know how to make love to a woman, please, this will help you. Without touching her. It's not a sexual book. All right? One pastor in Canada told me that when they bought the books to their church, that young men were rushing it and they finished it. The little that came back and said, ah, we thought it was about sex. It's not about sex. How to make love to a woman? Because a woman is first emotional. You make love to a woman emotionally first before you make love to her physically. Most men don't know. Because she's not as, she's not wired like you. A man can get aroused in one minute. A, a woman, average man, is one day to get sexually in the mood. One day. So you say, say, say love making for a woman starts in the morning, not in the night. But for a man, a man can get a man can even be innocent and thinking about God and get aroused. <laughs> Down here and up here are not connected, not, they don't relate. They are not the same family. So women don't understand this. But for a woman, everything goes together. <laughs> I can't say the couple. They, they, they were, their complaint was that the man said, We were trying to have sex, and my wife wanted to talk. I said, That's how she that's how she gets aroused. He didn't understand. I said, that's how she gets around. You guys had a pending issue. She wanted to have sex. That's why she needed to talk because that talking will remove the thing, the stopping the sex so that she can be in the mood. When I explained it, he now understood because he was saying, ah, we have removed, we are removing, we want to do something, you say you want to talk. <laughs> because the average man, she's not like you. 
She's an emotional being. If there's something pending, she can't be in the mood. I don't know if you're, is it making sense? This book shall help you. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> the guy couldn't believe it. You want to talk. We're removing clothes. You say you want to talk. <laughs> I said, that's how, that's how she gets around. That's foreplay. That's her own foreplay. Praise God. <laughs> Marriage will grow you. Many people think they are good at premarital sex. It's a different game inside marriage. It's a different game inside marriage. All right. The last one I'll talk about before I preach this morning. A to Z of marriage. One of our best selling books. Very easy to read. We taught in alphabetical order what love means to a man and to a woman. Um, we told um, women that A for men is acceptance. Men like acceptance. You must first give a man acceptance. And we told women, I mean men, that for women A is attention. All right. We also taught them R for men is respect. Men like respect. And we said for women, R is romance. Women like romance. I was sharing a story. I don't know who I was telling, whether it's Pastor Toyosi or so. How that Chicago is important to this book. Because the story I normally share when I um, talk about this book. How that my wife's birthday, um, I had been promising her and declaring, even when we're single, that I'll fly you around the world business class. I'll fly you to America business. We didn't even have visa then. <laughs> We didn't have visa then, so I was saying I'll fly you around the world business class and everything. So one time, her birthday was now approaching, and I thought, hey, let me fly you. Um, she loves Joyce Meyer, and Joyce Meyer was having 30 years in ministry. So I said, oh, let me fly you to the Joyce Meyer conference, your birthday period, and by surprise. So I just told her, hey, um, our pastor said she should pick somebody at the airport. So she just said, ah, when did they start sending you to the airport? I said, he couldn't find another person to go. So she just got dressed. We got to the airport, and I said, um, I'm, not flying you. I'm not picking anybody. I'm flying you to the United States business class for your birthday for Joyce Meyer conference. And she was like, ah, I've not even packed. As a brother, my debit card, I said, you buy everything. <laughs> you buy everything you need on the trip. Because women like shopping anyway. <laughs> and um, Chicago was one of the places, the places we landed first before we now flew to St. Louis. So that's why Chicago is a part of that, that story. <laughs> Praise God. Women like romance. You must always surprise a woman. All right? Don't, don't be boring. Romance is not hard. It's doing the simple things in a special way. The same thing you want to do, but just make it special. All right? Praise God. All right. So let's get into today. So please, all these books are available. I'll be able to sign them at the back as we go. Women, don't forget the one of um, all year round. Very important. All right. So one more time, can we wish all the men a happy Father's Day? Please turn to a man around you and wish him a happy Father's Day. Hallelujah. The world is in need of fathers. The world is in need of fathers. I, I don't know how to emphasize this. You know, I can't emphasize this enough. The world is in need of fathers. Fathers are endangered species. We have men, but we don't have fathers. We have boys, but we don't have fathers. Because to be a father is very different from being a man. When you're a man, you are literally seeking out for your own good. You are looking out for your own self. You don't have much responsibility outside of your own desires and dreams. But when you become a father, you become someone that looks out for other people. So there's a big difference. We have men. We have boys. Like I told you, as a man, you are looking out for yourself and for your dreams. When you're a boy, you are irresponsible. You're never looking out for anything. Everybody's looking out for you. But when you're a father, the difference is that now you are a covering. That's who a father is. You are a covering. So you are looking out for everybody under you. You are also a source. It's one of the meanings of the word father in the Bible. It's source. That is why the Bible says the woman came out of the man. So the man is the source of the woman. It doesn't mean women are inferior. It's just a biblical fact that women came out of men and men are like the source of women. This is why women like to always have a covering. Women like to always have a covering. Women like to always have someone like a father figure. Always like to have that. All right? So as a man, when you become a father, you are now providing covering for everyone around you. The world is in need of more fathers than just mere men. More fathers than just boys. I've said as a, as a father, you are a source. Okay? You are a source. 
most of us came from um, countries where we probably didn't, we're not crazy about the government of the country. We didn't, we're not crazy about how they were running things. But right now, as a father, you are now also a government. So it's your turn to show if you can do a better job than the people we all criticize. You are now the source of a new nation. When you're a father, a nation is coming out of you. That's why we call Abraham father today. He said, through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham now is no more just a boy. He's no more just a man. He is now the father of faith. Because he gave birth to the nation of Israel. So I need to ask you for all the men in the house, are you a father? And if you're a father or you want to be a father, what nation is going to come out of you? Literally, when you're a father, God is giving you a chance to build a nation. To build a nation. What nation is going to come out of you? Do you know <laughs> that the whole country of Israel, Israel is actually one man's name. I mean, is that not touching? That the whole country of Israel, Israel, that, the name Israel is a human being's name. Imagine if there's a country of Toyosi. And somebody says, he has the passport of the nation of Toyosi and is respected around the world. A nation came out of a man. That is who you are as a father. And you have to be deliberate to go that far. If you think you are, being a father is all about what you enjoy in this earth, then you have missed the point. It's about what you birth. So what do you want? What country, what nation do you want to birth? I want to ask all the fathers. What nation do you want to birth? What design do you have for that nation? You must have a family vision as a man, sir. You must have a family vision. Sit down with, if you don't have one already, sit down with your wife tonight. And say, what kind of nation do we want to build? And once you design that vision of that nation, be intentional about creating it. It's so amazing. It was supposed to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But Esau sold his birthright. So he became the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I wonder how Esau's grandchildren feel. They lost their place because their father, their source, was not intentional about the future. I pray for all the boys and all the men that you will become the fathers that your children will be proud of in the name of Jesus. When you are a father, you are a source. When you are a father, next thing, you, are, you, are also, you also bring stability. You bring stability or stability. You are like the spine that holds the home together. This is why when a father is absent, the home crumbles. And no disrespect to women. I know there are a lot of women that are single moms doing the job of a father and a mother or doing things alone, hey, we, we, we respect you. But least, let's, not, let's, not, let's not lie to the, to the men in the house. As a father, you bring stability. Once you are not there, it won't be the same. A man brings a certain level of stability to a home that no other person can bring. So, abandoning sheep, abandoning your family, you need to know that you are actually destroying one nation. In the name of seeking your own selfish interest. I can't count the amount of men I've seen sometimes just carry their bag and walk away. You bring stability. It is both biblical and even statistical. Those people that follow my teachings know that I, 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 I like to cover all three spaces. I'll cover scripture, I'll cover science, I'll cover statistics. So if you don't like scripture, we can talk statistics to prove the same point. We can talk science. They found out that homes that are without fathers are in incredibly endangered. Children from those homes, very likely to end in prison, very likely to have low self-esteem, very likely not to have confidence, very likely not to do well academically. The dangers are so much when the fathers are not present. In fact, what they found out was that only father homes 
rate almost as same as father mother homes. Did you get that? They say when the, when the father is present, even if the mother is not present, they said the, the, the statistics is close to when the father and mother are present. In other words, if the mother is not present and the father is present, it's almost as if nothing was missing. It doesn't mean women are not important. It just means these children gain so much from what the father brings that it is, it is so vital how you speak. And as a man, the tendency is this. There are three things you, 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 you'll be called to do. To provide, to protect, and to preside. To provide, to protect, and to preside. Now, the challenge is that most men think when they hear provide, it only means money. That has been the challenge We've been passing from generation to generation of men that, oh, just make money. Just provide for your family financially. And that is true, but that's not the total truth. We've passed that syllabus from generation to generation, and it has caused more harm than good. I have a message I titled seven things men should provide. As a man, when you are a provider, money is just one of the seven things. Most men are scoring one over six in their homes. One of the things you also need to provide is emotional support for your family. To provide that one, you need to be emotionally present. Most men are not. The excuse is that I'm trying to make money, I'm working. Thank you for the money you are bringing. We really appreciate you. But please, your children and your spouse also needs you available emotionally. That's why if you notice, the father of Jesus Christ didn't just multiply bread. There was a time, the father of Jesus Christ Attending his baptism. Somebody understand? You know, nowadays some parents don't attend their children into house sports or recital or because you are busy. Mm -mm. The father of Jesus Christ had time. He had the whole world to manage. But he said, This is my son's baptism. He had time to attend. He took picture and he announced to people watch. He said, This is my beloved son. In whom I'm well pleased. Listen, fathers in the house, your child will value your presence more than the presents that you buy. Your child will value your presence, especially when you are there and you give him commendation. One of the things children crave the most is the commendation of their father, not their mother. Not because mothers are not important, it's because mothers are lovers. From beginning, mothers have been given commendation. So he has received already from mother. The person he wants to gain respect from. Because men don't give that easily. Is the dad. And the father of Jesus Christ attended and publicly commended. Jesus has not even done the ministry then. He has not performed any miracle then. So you're not giving this commendation when your son passes exam or does well. You give this commendation because he's your son. Very important, fathers. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Your daughters need your admiration. You must be the first love of your daughters. They must hear I love you so much from you that when one stupid boy on the street tells them it's not the first time they are hearing it. Because women are moved by love. Especially the ones that have not received it at home. When they go out there, and one mumu boy, if you don't know what mumu is, mumushious boy, that has no bearing, has no sense, has no job, has no spirit, tells her I love you. It will spin her brain because she has never heard it before. She needs to hear it from you. Fathers in the house, tell your sons you are pleased with them. Tell your daughters that you love them. Emotional support. On that thing you provide is discipline. As a father, there's a fear kids have for their fathers. Like I said, the reason why God is so beautiful in design in the Bible, there's what is called the right hand of judgment and the left hand of mercy, of God's mercy. God has both sides. And a man and a woman together is what represents the image of God. Separately, we're not the total image. Are you here, somebody? Because in Genesis, when he made them and said, 
be fruitful and multiply, they were still one together. They now began to explain how they created, but they were one. He said he blessed them. So they were two in one. So God has judgment and God has mercy. The mercy side of God is usually like a woman. A woman we always love. Women are lovers. A woman will never disown her baby. A woman, that's what the Bible says, can a woman forget her suckling child? He said it will hardly happen. Women are lovers by nature. But there is a discipline men bring that a child also needs. Because a child can't grow on only the love of the mother. He needs that discipline and firmness of a father. Praise God. The next one, you provide strength. You provide strength. Your child gains audacity and confidence from you. Your child learns how to stand strong, learns courage from you. Your child learns how to fly. You provide feathers from you. He learns what he can do and what he can't do from you. Ah, I was shocked some months ago, two or three months ago. So my first daughter used to be my guy. I use used to because she's now becoming a woman, so she's not like that again. But when she was young, she was a bit tomboyish. When she was younger. So she liked all the crazy things. When we travel like this abroad, my wife will go shopping. She will follow me to go and check cars. Me, that's what I do. Once I'm free, I go and check sports cars, go to shops, go and check cars, go and check bikes. My, my, my daughter will follow me. Go check bikes, check cars. We'll take pictures, Ferrari. We'll snap. That was she, she likes all those manly things. But as she began to grow, you know, 10, 11, she began to grow puberty, you know. She began to, became, began to become a woman, you know. <laughs> so her attitude started changing. She didn't like those wild things like that again. She said liking feminine things. Well, shocker for me. This is my best friend. <laughs> Who is your guy? My guy was not becoming a babe. I said, no. <laughs> so one time, she and her cousins, I took them somewhere. They were going to do all these things that they climb. And this is my daughter before. When she was a baby, if you lock the door, she would drag a chair to the door, climb the chair to open the lock. She was that, you know, active as a, as a small girl. So now she was becoming a woman. So she didn't like all those kind of wild things. So they were climbing this thing. And they were all excited to climb it. When she got up, she, ah, she doesn't want to climb. I said, no, you must climb this thing. You know? She, she was scary. It was high. She's scared about it. the boys, the two cousins were guys. Ah, those ones climbed and went there. So I was bothered. I said, No, you're actually courageous. You were courageous before. Now, even though I understand you are being a woman now, so I can't, you can't do some crazy things, but I still want your courage to be there because in this life, you need courage. So I kept persuading her that you can do it. So when she came down, I've learned that children like reward. So I said, Okay, if you can do it, what you can tell me to buy something for you. So she likes skateboard. She said, Let's go back. Dad. If I climb it, will you buy me the skateboard? I said, I'll buy you the skateboard. So we went back the next day. And she braced herself and did it. For me, it wasn't about the thing. It was about I didn't want her to give up. Something she, she wanted to do it initially. She just got up there and became scared. I said, no, I want you to finish what you start. So there, there's a strength a father gives to a child. When they feel they can't go on. When they feel they will fail. You as a father, be deliberate about providing strength. Hallelujah. I pray for all the fathers in the house. You will be a covering in the name of Jesus. You will be a source of stability in the name of Jesus. You will be a source of strength in the name of Jesus. Your children will ride on your wings and take on life. They will ride on your wings and go further than you have gone. In the name of Jesus. Every generation should be an improvement on the previous one. And that's what intentional fathering does. Every father should be a platform, should be a stage for their children to go further. Hallelujah. And lastly, for the fathers, after that, I'll not talk to the women about how to treat the fathers in the short time I have. But lastly, for the fathers, please, fathers, let me encourage you, let me charge you. There's nothing as powerful as your children seeing you serve the Lord. Not hearing you serve the Lord. Seeing you serve the Lord. It's one of the biggest deposits you can live on this earth. Biggest deposits. Children are used to seeing their mother pray, seeing their mother worship, seeing their mother go to church, seeing their mother carry the Bible. What they don't see enough of is their father pray. 
What they don't see enough of is their father read the Bible. What they don't see enough of is their father be the one to champion going to church. Can I challenge your fathers with the short time you have left with those kids? Because the mistake fathers make is I think they're going to be there for those kids. No, your, you, there are stages of influence you have with kids and it's seasonal. Please, may I beg you, Father, you can't postpone some things. That's why I'm talking about your presence. You can't postpone it. There's a season they need you. Once they start making their own friends, have their own phone, have their own stuff, they don't need you. You need to realize this. The way they will now interact with you is different. And it's how you do the beginning stage that determines the other stages. Fathers think, I can catch up with my kids at any time. No, most fathers die lonely. Most fathers die lonely. I heard a story of a man that when he was busy making money, his children would call him. He would say, I'll send you money. He would call him and say, send me your account. He wasn't talking to them. He was just sending them money. Now, he had retired. They were now working on any money. He was not trying to connect with them. Then they were telling him the same thing. Send me your account number. We are busy too. We can't talk to you. He died a lonely man. Don't think you can postpone connecting with your children. You cannot. It's a seasonal thing. You have to do it now. This is why God gave you a woman as a wife. Sh women are good with mixing things together. Men, I told you men are wired one track mind. I'm making money. That's all I'm doing now for the next 40 years. That's what men think. The way men are wired, almost any other thing suffers when they are facing one project. Women have the ability to say, as we are building house, we can still be looking beautiful. <laughs> have you seen women that have mental health? They see makeup. Women are good at balancing things. They can mix everything. Men, men, it's one track. We are buying house. Let everybody suffer till we finish paying. No. No. Women can mix things. <laughs> but man, they, I checked out the amount of billionaires are three or so, or so years ago. They, they found out that there were about 11,000 billionaires or 3,000, I can't remember now, about 3,400 billionaires in the world. Female billionaires, sorry. I can't remember the figures now, but basically about 10% of those billionaires are women. About 3,400 billionaires. About 10% are women, billionaires. Out of the 10% or so that are 11% that are women, half of those people, about 60% of them, inherited the billions. That means they didn't build the money, they didn't make the money, they inherited it. Female billionaires. Then out of the 40% left, half of them inherited and built, they're not just, just a small fraction built. Why? Because the average woman's dream is not to be a billionaire. It's men that get confused. Women know that at a certain stage of life, an extra $1,000 will make a difference to your quality of life. Women know that. Men don't know that. Men just keep making money. See, I want to work hard and make 100000 in my savings investment portfolio this year. So, okay, when you invest it, what will you do with the income? I will invest it. <laughs> okay, when you invest that one now, what will you do with it? We will diversify it into two investments. Men get to a stage, they don't even know why they are working again. <laughs> but women are able to know, we have made the best investment. Let's go on vacation. Let's go for spa. Women understand that. We need to look beautiful while we are doing it. So that's why you notice women don't, women don't, women don't, women don't do so. Because at the end of the day, you, at a certain stage of life, if I give you an extra $10,000, it's not going to make a difference. It's not. But women know that spending time with my children will make a difference. Going on vacation with my spouse will make a difference. Going for spa will make a difference. Just looking good. Going for shopping. So women can diversify life. But men just say, oh, I'm working now, I'm working now. By the time you finish working, I'm building life on the building. Now look around. Your children are gone. They are gone. And you're coming to come and eat money. They say, we don't need money, dad. We live in the US. We don't do those kind of things. We don't build houses in the village. <laughs> Lord, I live in, <laughs> dad, I live in Chicago. I don't build house in the village. I'm not coming to your village. <laughs> Do you understand? You have, now you've lost them. You've lost them by that time. So manage the two. Spend time with them now. Don't postpone it. Are you getting what I'm saying? My time is fast spent. I have five more minutes. Let me quickly talk to ladies in the house. Whether you're married or not, it will apply to you. What do fathers really want? Because somebody needs to speak for fathers. Even fathers sometimes can't articulate what they want. They just grumble. <laughs> they don't even know what they want. So, men, women, let me tell you. There are seven of them. I can't touch all of them. I'll just mention three if I have the time. Number one, fathers want acceptance. We want acceptance. It's part of what I talked in that book, A to Z. Mothers and daughters and wives, please learn. 
that as fathers we don't have it all figured out. We too don't know everything we are doing. We are learning on the way. We've never been here before. <laughs> Do you understand? This is not our, this is all of, most of us, this is our first marriage. <laughs> Even people that have done it many times, they are still getting it wrong. This is our first time. We are figuring it out as we are going. So please, we need acceptance. We need to be able to know that we can fail and the whole thing will not scatter. You will still believe in us. Many men hide their failures, hide their struggles, because they know the women in their lives won't continue with them or won't respect them if they have failures. Men need acceptance. I said it in the camp. This is why men are usually more attached to their mothers than even to their wives. And women worldwide complain. Why is he always attached to his mother? Because on this earth, if there's one person that will give him 100% acceptance, it's his mom. No matter how much a man is doing or not doing, one person that will support him unconditionally is his mom. Even if he kills somebody, he would rather call his mom than call his wife. The mom would say, eh, you kill four people. He said, who else knows? <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Start going to your auntie in Michigan. <laughs> Go to your auntie in Detroit. Go and stay there before anybody know. Because she will cover him. No matter how many times he commits offense, she will come to the station and bail him. The wife will say, ah, this useless man. He will tell the kids, don't, fool, don't be like your daddy. Because most times, women understand the concept of unconditional love. They don't understand the concept of unconditional respect. Women believe that you should love them no matter what. But they believe that respect is end. In a covenant marriage, according to Ephesians 5, love must be unconditional. But the respect for the man too has to be unconditional. That's what the Bible says. And most men, we, are, we say it, that they would rather be respected than even be loved. They want to know that if they make mistakes, you won't kill them. They can't tell you because they have pride. Men have pride. We are wired that way. Respect means a lot to us. Are you here, somebody? So acceptance. Can you allow us to make mistakes sometimes and not crucify us? All right? Praise God. Number two, um, men, fathers need assistance. We need your help. That was the first reason God gave you to us in the first place. was because we needed help. That's why if I told the ladies in the first service, if you are praying for your husband, I pray for your husband, I will meet all your needs. You are wasting your time. What you pray for is a husband that God has wired you to help. Your first and principal role, the reason why they created you in the first place as a woman, is to help. That's why you are wired with the capacity you are wired with. Your capacity as a woman is incredible. That's why it pains me when I say a woman that has not developed herself. You, you have capacity. You have capacity. Hallelujah. You are a helper. Men need assistance. We need assistance in the areas of our lives that we struggle. I didn't know I had very bad financial habits until I met my wife. Ah, I was reckless. <laughs> I didn't even know. You know, when you are single, you are the chairman, board of trustees. You're also the board of trustees. You're the secretary. You are the parliament. You are the president. The so any bill you pass, you go the other way and sign it and sign it and sign it. So it passes through. Because you are the all in all. The moment you marry, that's when you find out all of your bills have been rejected in the house. <laughs> because they are nonsense bills that you didn't think through. I was a wreck financially. On, we were planning wedding. We didn't have money for wedding. In our, on our wedding, we didn't print program. You know program? That's if people used to fund themselves. <laughs> we didn't print it. We couldn't afford it. We just did photocopy three. Yes. Why, why do people need a program? It's not to fund themselves. They should bring fun. We print three photocopy. The MC, the pastor, and one other person that needs it. We will tell the rest of what to do when it's time. We didn't, we didn't have money. But guess what? As we were going to book the hall for the wedding, the person that was renting, the agent renting the hall out, we now started, me and him now started discussing dogs. He now took me to where they are selling dog. <laughs> we have not paid. We, can't, we don't have money to pay for the hall. I bought two dogs. <laughs> two. Because if I buy one, it will be lonely. I bought two pit bulls from him. Do you understand? I was a financial wreck. <laughs> but when my wife came into my life, oh, she's an amazing person when it comes to money. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. That was, I was explaining that to the singles in the, in the morning, that marriage is for us to complement each other. I'm a spender, she's a saver. 
My wife can save. I've told Nigeria, stop borrowing from China, borrow from my wife. <laughs> because no matter how, scarce, how much cash there is, my wife always has money. How many of you know people like that? They can save. My wife can save. She can price anything she won't buy. She always still has her money. Me, I finished spending my money long ago. <laughs> and I'll be needing money in the house. I said, ah, I need 100 k She said, okay, I have. I said, ah, you have money in this house. She always has money because she saves all her money. So she began to help me. So today, now, we have money. <laughs> because I committed the whole finances of the family to her. By the way, you know, I didn't have time to go into purpose of marriage. See, as a man, you don't have to run the finances if you are not good at it. If you have run it for five years and it's not doing well, that should be a, <laughs> a point that let somebody else run it more. Maybe your wife might be a gift to you in terms of management. You might need to listen to her a bit more. But today is not for that. So let me see, continue. So we need assistance, guys. Ladies, men need assistance. We are busy dropping our things, scattering the house. That's why God gave you to us. Help us arrange it. <laughs> Women like to train their husband and love their children. My wife says it should be the other way around. You should love your husband and train your children. His mother didn't train him to arrange clothes. It's you that want to train him at 40. The Bible didn't say you should train your husband. It says you should love your husband and train your children. Make sure your own, because your own children, they drop things around. You say, Junior, why are you dropping your things and you pick it up? Oh, oh, oh. You, are you scattering? You pick it up for him and arrange it. You are loving him instead of training him. Train him for his wife. What you saw, may your own daughter-in-law not go through it. So tell Junior, come here. Come and pick it. This is how to arrange it. Then when your husband drops it, you say, baby, you drop your things again. You pick it. But women do it the other way around. They rebuke the man, then they love the children. Mm -mm. We need assistance. Number what? Three, I have to move now. We need appreciation. Fathers need appreciation. Listen, women, listen, this will help you. Men and women are very different. I've told you that. When you tell a woman she's not good enough, she does everything within her power to prove you wrong. When you tell a man he's not good enough, he don't ever, does everything within his power to prove you right. <laughs> I'll say it again. Women, when you tell a woman she's not good enough, she does everything within her power to prove you wrong. When you tell a man he's not good enough, he don't ever, does everything within his power to prove you right. If you tell a woman you are useless, she will show you she's not useless. She will step up her game. If you tell a man he's useless, say, ah, you will see the useless part of me now. You think I, you, you will see me now in uselessness. <laughs> So, men love appreciation. One of the ways to get a man to do more is to appreciate the little he's doing. The, again, women, because you have the gift of details, your eyes first goes to what is not complete, not what is complete. This is how you are wired. You are a fixer. So, your eyes goes first to what is not working instead of what is working. No matter how bad your husband is, no matter how bad your marriage is, there must be one thing working. Yeah? Go and sing about that one thing. That's your job. Don't focus on the night. If you tell the man is not doing well, the way men approach what they don't do well is to run from it, not to come there. Because men are so guarded about their ego. Once they know I'm not good at being a husband, but I'm good at work, he will get the bed at work to live at work. Because he wants to stay where he feels is good. And he will run away from where he's not good. So if he has one thing about him that is good, praise him for it. We need appreciation. I almost didn't marry Pastor Mildred at our early years because of that. Not because she wasn't appreciative or she meant not to be appreciative, but she's not very expressive at the beginning of our relationship. We're not married then. So, and she's not materialistic at all. She's not the kind of girl that if you buy her something, she will shout. No. If you buy her somebody an airplane and you buy her a, 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 a microwave, you might get the same expression. If you give her a million dollars and you give her a million naira, she will thank you the same way. For men, it's not like that. You buy me an airplane. We will shut down now. Do you understand? <laughs> for men, it's not like that at all. <laughs> you give me a million dollars. I will say, you, you can offend me for the rest of your life. I will not be angry. <laughs> you understand? But she's not much like at all. So when I do big things for her, she will give me the same reaction as when I do very small things. So I say, you are not appreciative. I can't marry somebody that's not appreciative. And she said, I'm happy. I'm happy. <laughs> Her face is the same when she's excited and when she's just doing nothing. Now, it's better for you. I learned that because now my daughter is like her. She has, uh, my second daughter is exactly like her. So that one too, if you do anything for her, she'll be like, thank you, daddy. <laughs> like if I knock you, better jump and thank me. <laughs> 
but I knew I can relate to her because she has the same personality as my wife. So I knew that's how they are. They don't rejoice. They don't. They don't. They don't. They don't same reaction. <laughs> so men like appreciation. They will do better when you appreciate them for the small thing. That is. Don't focus on what's not working. I know as a woman, your mind is going to what's not working. But lastly, I have to close now. We want your admiration. Fathers want your admiration. Ladies, listen. A man wants to be your hero. That's his genuine dream. Women don't know this. That a man really, really wants to impress you. Genuinely, eh? A man wants to impress you. Pastor Emmanuel, you know, I'm, I'm a dog person. Like you had, I bought two dogs on my wedding day, even though I could, I could not pay for her. <laughs> there was a time in my house, we had about 17 dogs. Yes. I'm a dog person. You know, and, uh, you know, we were trying to breed dogs at the time. So we had small ones, they littered their own children, about eight. We had another one, they littered. They, were just give, they gave birth, so they were 17 altogether uh, in the house. And um, we had a guy that used to take care of the dogs, bait them, feed them, clean up after them, you know. So we, we now needed a help in the house. We knew we couldn't get the same guy that cleans dogs to come and be washing plates in the house. We didn't want that dog thing in the house. So we now got a female help to do the housework in the house. Big mistake. You don't keep male help and female help in the same house. You won't breed only dogs. <laughs> they are going to breed for you too. They are going to breed only dogs. <laughs> The first day, this guy has been going his way as a gentleman every day, doing the dog thing. The first day we brought the female help. First day, I kid you not. I saw him without shirt. I said, what's wrong with you? My brother, he has seen woman. He tore his shirt. I was bouncing around the house with chest. <laughs> because men want to please women. Women don't realize that. Men genuinely want to please women. It's just that many men give up after a while because you nag and complain too much. You just, they just give up and stop trying. But genuinely, men want to please women. Men want to please women. They want to dazzle women. They want to surprise women. So we need your admiration. A man genuinely craves for it. Men have a hero complex. That's why in Ephesians 5, the command they give to men is to love their wives in a way that they can give themselves for her. That's be her hero. He, he should be willing to die for you. And that's what he genuinely wants to do. But he needs your admiration. He needs to know that you actually admire him. And this can't be faked. So you need God to help you because he's not a perfect man, but you still need to admire him in spite of it. Most women celebrate people outside more than their own husbands. Big mistake women make. They celebrate the great apostles, the great pastors that they know from far. But they don't celebrate the pastor in their own house. Celebrate the, the, the music and worship artists that they know from far. And they always even tell the man, why are you not like? Why are you not like? Mm -mm. Don't ever compare your husband to anybody. Admire him. Even when he's not at his best, he craves your admiration. He craves it. Some of the men you are admiring from far, if you two live with them, with how good you are at nagging, you will find something to complain about you'll find something to complain about. Do you know there's a woman that was married to David and she nagged David down. David was dancing, celebrating God. She said, why is the king disgracing? This is David that everybody was celebrating. This is David that women came to sink and say, David killed, um, Saul killed 1,000. David killed 10,000. But the woman in his own house didn't see anything good about him. So this is why the moment David met Abigail that was even already married with children, and Abigail respected him. He had never been respected like that before. Abigail knelt down to talk to him. Abigail called him Lord ten times in one conversation. David followed her on social media. <laughs> followed her on Snapchat. Followed her on Instagram. Followed her. On... The moment she posted R.I.P. Rest in peace for her husband. David slid into her DM. <laughs> and married her immediately. Because he was living with someone that didn't admire him. And he finally met someone. You can't even assist a man you don't know his dreams. Ladies, you need to sit down and ask your husband his dreams. Ask him, what are your prayer points? What are your dreams? You know, women talk for affection. Men talk for information. A woman can talk to you for one hour and not get any tangible information about your life. Because for a woman, talk is not about information. It's about affection. A woman talks to you because you are somebody important. A man talks to you because there's something important to say. 
So as a woman, you need to sometimes sit down and ask your husband, what are your prayer points? What are your dreams? So that you can pray for That's one thing that Abigail did to David. I call Abigail the unforgettable woman. I have a whole message on it. Abigail didn't appeal to David's emotion. He appealed to David's logic. He didn't tell David, don't kill my husband because I'll be a widow. No. He said, look, if you kill my husband, you know you are going to be king. He, she knew David's goal. She knew David's vision. She knew David's dream. Men are always inspired by a woman that knows his future. Say, so you're going to be king. Don't dirty your hand with this thing now. David had never heard any woman tell him he's going to be king. They were chasing him from place to place. He was so touched and moved by that woman. He came to marry her. So I pray for the woman in the house. You'll be like the Abigail generation. You'll be that unforgettable woman that every man will thank God to have. And I pray for the fathers in the house. You will take your role as fathers and you will make God and your family proud. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand.